talk about, um, when they talk about love, talk about the first moment of falling in love. Well, I'm one of those people. And uh, my name is Alma, and the title of my paper is The Love Machine. In Observations on Transference Love from 1915, Freud writes that transference love is the byproduct of the analytic situation. As love for the analyst can hinder the smooth flow of the analytic cure, Freud examines how to deal with transference love and use it towards the healing process. He proposes three possible ways of dealing with transference love. One, end the treatment. Two, renounce love with suppression. Or three, return love to the analyst's end. Unsatisfied with the three possible solutions, Freud suggests to closely examine the origins of this love. Transference love in Freudian psychoanalysis is the patient's unconscious eroticism towards the parent that is placed onto the analyst because of the analytic situation. If transference love is indeed the early eroticism towards the parent, then it is worth examining the injunction, love to a parent. This injunction signals that the subject has no choice, that love is prescribed, but this does not mean the absence of choice. In his 1996 essay, At First, First Sight, Mladen Dolat, his last name is spelled D-O-L-A-R, the co-founder of Ljubljana School of Psychoanalysis writes that if there is a choice, it is a forced one. It is decided in advance. In Sublime Object of Ideology, Slavoj Žižek writes, and I quote, if I am directly ordered to love a woman, it is clear that this does not work. In a way, love must be free. But on the other hand, if I proceed as if I really have a free choice, if I start to look around and say to myself, hmm, let's see which one of these women I will fall in love with, it is clear that this also does not work, that it is not real love. The paradox of love is that it is a free choice, but a choice which never arrives in the present. It is always already made. At a certain moment, I can only state retroactively that I've already chosen. Dolan illustrates the mechanism of forced choice in love by citing Lacan's famous example from the four fundamental concepts of psychoanalysis, your life or your money. In the example, there is no choice at all. One can really choose only one, choose life and give up the money. And even this alternative is curtailed, life without money. While the other alternative is void, choosing money entails losing life, thereby losing both. Dollar claims that love, such as love your parent, country, neighbor, and even erotic love, has this mechanism attached to it. He writes, to put it simply, one is compelled to choose love and thereby give up the freedom of choice. Well, by choosing freedom of choice, one loses both. Any good melodrama will illustrate the case where love and autonomy rule each other out. A common scenario in books and movies has a young man or woman meet their love interest quite by chance. Here are two typical examples where the protagonists are literally swept away by their love interests. Julia Roberts in Eat, Pray, Love is knocked off her feet by Javier Bertin. She was on her bicycle and he um, hit her with his jeep. Or Diane Lane, who was blown away by Olivia Martinez in Unfaithful, it was a windy day she falls down. In both examples, destiny seemingly plays its hand. In each case, it is the other that has chosen, not the young woman or man who was powerless. What happened purely by chance is then retroactively recognized as the realization of the subject's most innermost wishes. What seemed a chance meeting was no chance at all. And I quote Dolan, the moment of subjectivation is precisely that moment of suspension of subjectivity to the other, fate, providence, eternal plan, destiny, or whatever one might call it, manifesting itself as the pure contingency of the real, unquote. Erotic love does not allow for deliberations of gains and losses, thinking about the advantages or disadvantages of certain choices. It demands the unconditional surrender to the other. The so-called chance encounter is accompanied by the moment of recognition, the moment when the subject recognized, recognizes what has always already been there, and retroactively, the subject's previous existence is infused with new meaning. Everything one has done in the past has led them to precisely this moment, this chance meeting. The moment of recognition, Dola writes, implies that the first time is already repetition, but realizes what one has already known. The birth of love is always aligned around the gaze, which can take peculiar forms, such as falling in love with a portrait or with a veiled stranger, 
and it may even be deflected to the voice, but it is the exchange of the gaze which, Boller claims, emerges as the firm rock of positivity on which to build one's existence, the authoritative and commanding presence by which to rule one's life, the steadfast support of, being, of one's being against all odds. I'll briefly address the gaze here. Dollar draws an analogy between two sudden and miraculous moments, falling in love at first sight and recognizing one's own image in the mirror. The latter is marked with jubilation, but, as Dollar says, the gaze returned also encloses another message. It points to a thin line between jubilation and the most shattering anxiety. The jubilation of recognizing one's image in the mirror must be paid for. The subject must incur a certain loss. This is one of my favorite quotes by Dollar, where I believe he um, talks about Lacan's um, claim that one cannot be both the subject and the object at the same time. When I recognize myself in the mirror, it is already too late. There is a split. I cannot recognize myself and at the same time be one with myself. With the recognition, I have already lost what one would call the self-being, the immediate coincidence with myself in my being and jouissance. By doubling, one becomes cut off from a part, the most valuable part of one's being, the immediate self-being of jouissance. This cut from a part of self-being is what Lacan calls a vieta. It is the loss that one cannot see in the mirror. Thought distinguishes between the mirror image and the double that is best described in Freud's essay, The Uncanny, and which Freud calls the alter ego. While the mirror image implies the split between the imaginary and the real, the double is the mirror Im image that includes the abhyata, that part of the subject that has no mirror reflection. The double gains its own being, and the split between the imaginary and the real is no longer there. The two coincide. The double is the same as me, plus the abhyata, that invisible part of my being added to my image which offers a clue as to why the first encounter is imbued with both jubilation and anxiety. In seminar 10 on anxiety, Lacan writes that it is not the loss of the object that produces anxiety, but rather the opposite. The object is too close, and in this case, it is included in the mirror image. Anxiety produced by seeing one's double is not produced by a lack or a loss, but by gaining something too much of too close a presence of the object. If love has the mechanism of forced choice attached to it, if love and autonomy rule each other out, and the subject must endorse the choice already made, and if love demands the unconditional surrender to the other, then love can be artificially produced and manipulated. Take, for example, a close 18th century libertine no novel, Dangerous Liaisons, famous movie with John Malkovich and Bernard Close. It takes a little to manipulate love, some flattery and seduction, a bit of jealousy, a grain of doubt, big sacrifice, and so on. So love is not a set of unpredictable emotions, as Dollar claims. There is a mechanical predictability in its emergence that can be experimentally induced. In Freud's essay, The Uncanny, there is an episode in Hoffman's story, The Sandman. The main character, Nathaniel, falls in love with a doll, Olympia. Olympia appears to be a shy and beautiful girl who, apart from the occasional uh-huh, and good night love, was silent. Sounds like an analyst. She is assigned a particular role. It is enough for her to be just present, say the occasional uh-huh, at the appropriate time to produce the figure of the other. Nathaniel falls madly in love. What is interesting is not that Olympia turns out to be automation, but Nathaniel's odd reaction to automation. His love for automation is itself automatic. Olympia's blank stare, facial expression, and silence set up a blank screen from which he, Nathaniel, only receives his own message. Though I write, the mechanical doll only highlights the mechanical character of love relations. Both the subject falling in love and the object can be reduced to an automation. We have the perfect love machine. There's a movie that came out about a year ago called Ex Machina with Alicia Vikander, where the protagonist falls in love uh, with automation. Um, it's unfortunate that the movie misses the point of um, highlighting this mechanical, automatic character of love instead what makes us human, blah, blah. So, um, but it's an interesting, interesting movie. 
In the analytic situation, the love for the analyst emerges with mechanical regularity no matter who the analyst is or who the analyzant is. And if transference love appears pathological, this is because love is a pathological state. So why does the analytic situation produce the relation of love? The setup is straightforward. There's the analyst, the analyzant, and the ground rule, that there are no rules. The analyzant is invited to freely say what passes through his or her mind. What induces free association is the fundamental assumption that the analyst holds the key to the analyzant's solutions and that the analyst will decipher these free associations. And we're going to address this first aspect of transference this morning. This absence of rules allows the minimal mechanism of transference to be embedded in speech addressed to the other. This flow of words is addressed to the other who appears as the figure of the analyst. Transference initially emerges as an opening to the unconscious, and this first aspect of transference is that the analytic situation triggers the free associations and the process of remembering and repeating the repressed. It emerges at the moment when the topic of discussion is too painful for the analyzant, who then responds to pain with love. For Freud, transference love is the starting point of analysis, the opening of the unconscious, and thus the opposite of resistance. The ground rule in the analytic situation carries with it the promise that resistances will be lifted and the repressed will come to light. However, the second aspect of transference love spoils the game. Here, transference love halts free associations and functions as the closing of the unconscious. Here's how um, Dollar describes the analyst. The analyst is ultimately the one who stands in the way of the free flow and hinders the repetition of the signifier with his massive presence, as Freud calls him, ein fremder Mensch. He puts himself in the place of the object that arrests the symbolic, something that cannot be symbolized and around which the symbolic revolves. End of quote. In this case, transference appears as an obstacle, and it is in this closing of the unconscious where transference love is located. The dialectics of transference love highlight several paradoxes. The analyst and the analytic situation both trigger free associations and bring them to a halt. Transference is both the opening and the closing of the unconscious. It is both the lever of the analytic cure, as Freud used it, and at the same time, its hindrance. The analytic situation is a love laboratory, making it the perfect place to study love in its pure form. The paradox of the analytic situation is that analysis, according to Dola, ultimately turns into analysis of a pathological state, transference, which it has itself created and which did not exist prior to the cure. Psychoanalysis can thus be seen as a device for artificial production of love and at the same time, an instrument to dissipate it, end of quote. Psychoanalysis makes love appear as a symptom and is ultimately the process of barring the mechanism that produced that love. If there are any prescriptions and advice that follow from psychoanalysis, it is to love your symptom as yourself. 